Hello, Michael here. Well, after much procrastination, I'm finally making this video revealing what I believe about hell. Already some of you are thinking, Michael, what do you mean what you believe about hell? Everyone already knows what hell is. It's a lake of fire where after the final judgment, God will cast ungodly, unrepentant sinners whose names are not found written in the book of life and there they'll stay in a state of eternal conscious torment. Well, it is true that that's the current popular view embraced by most Christian and Catholic churches, but believe it or not, throughout church history, that has not been the only view to be held by Christians. That's right, I said Christians, not cults or heretics. I'm talking about Bible-believing, Spirit-filled Christians. In fact, in the early church, the belief that hell is a place of eternal conscious torment was actually the minority view out of two other views. So before I reveal what I believe, let me give you a brief synopsis of the other two views. For time's sake, my explanation of each view is going to be quick. For a more thorough examination of each view, I highly recommend this book. All you want to know about hell Three Christian Views of God's Final Solution to Sin by Steve Gregg. I'll show you the cover right here. You can purchase this from most bookstores, christianbook.com or amazon.com. If you go online, you can easily find this book by searching Hell by Steve Gregg. If you're not familiar with Steve Gregg, you should be. I consider him the greatest Bible teacher of our time. His ministry website is thenarrowpath.com. You can also find him on YouTube. In the book, he does a complete examination of each view, including the pros and cons of each view. This book for me was life-changing, and it will be for many of you as well. Not only because of the topic, but because of how this book will teach you how to read the Bible properly. Okay, so let's get right to the three views of hell. For some of you, this is going to be really foreign. Some of you will be shocked because all your life, and most certainly your Christian life, you were taught there's only one definition of hell. So please stay with me. Okay, here we go. The first view is the one I already mentioned. It's referred to as the eternal conscious torment view. You're already so familiar with this belief that I really don't need to say anything, but I will anyway just briefly. The reason it's called eternal conscious torment is because it is the belief that you and all of us as individuals were created in the image of God. Of course we know that to be true. But the people holding this view would say that a major facet of being in the image of God is that we are all created to exist eternally. We're immortal, if you will. So, after your physical body dies, your spirit and or soul keeps on going, and because it will live forever, it has to live somewhere. If you're saved, you'll live with God forever. If not, You'll be cast into the lake of fire, which we believe to be hell, where you will dwell for all of eternity in unimaginable torment. The problem with this belief is that nowhere in the Bible does it say that we are eternal beings. In fact, on the contrary, the scriptures are clear that God alone possesses immortality and that we must be given eternal life by our Savior and Lord. It's not intrinsic. We must receive it as a gift. So that's the eternal conscious torment view. The second view of hell is called conditional mortality. Some also refer to it as the annihilation view. As a contrast to eternal conscious torment, conditional mortality teaches that mankind is not created as eternal beings. So what will happen to those whose names are not found in the book of life is that they will be cast into the lake of fire. There, they will serve a sentence of punishment for a length of time decided by God and are then annihilated.
They will cease to exist. They will die. And when you think about it, isn't that what God said would happen? Paul said in Romans, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember earlier I mentioned learning to read the Bible properly? Well, this verse is a perfect example of how most Christians, even pastors, do not. There's two things we have to comprehend in this verse. First is that it says the wages of sin is death, not the wages of sin is death and then an eternity of horrific torment in a lake of fire. Secondly, the verse is clearly giving the reader a contrast. It's either death or eternal life in Christ. It's one or the other, not eternal life in Christ or eternal life in hell. Another verse where we see how the obvious eludes us is in the most well-known Bible verse of our time. Of course, I'm talking about John 3.16. Most of us can quote it by memory, so let's recite it together. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not die and spend all eternity in unthinkable suffering. <laughs> What happened? One of us got off track, didn't we? Was it me? Well, isn't that what it says? <laughs> no, it doesn't, does it? It says that whoever believes in him will not perish. What does perish mean? It means to cease existing. It's total destruction. It means annihilation. Scary, isn't it? And let's not forget that Jesus warned us to fear God, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. <laughs> destroy soul and body in hell? If we are immortal beings, what was Jesus talking about? Okay, that's the conditional immortality view. The third view that many Christians have held throughout church history is called ultimate reconciliation. And this is the belief that God, through Christ Jesus, will ultimately redeem every person who has ever lived on the face of the earth. It's the belief that Jesus died for the whole world, and God will not lose one of them. Like the other two views, they do believe in hell and that the ungodly will go there, but ultimately their hearts can be changed, they can repent, and since Jesus paid the penalty even for them, they can be saved and given eternal life. Imagine that. Now that's good news. That unsaved loved one that you've been mourning over still might be saved in the end. But some of you might be thinking, people can't be saved after they've died and been cast into hell. Well, people who embrace ultimate reconciliation would reply, where in the Bible does it say that? Where in the Bible does it say that you can repent, believe, and be saved right up to the point where your heart stops beating, and then it's over? You've reached the point of no return. Now granted, there is a verse in Hebrews that says it's appointed that each man dies once, and after that comes the judgment. Of course that's true, but what happens after the judgment? A criminal can be tried in an earthly court and found guilty. When he's sentenced, that's the judgment. But what happens after that judgment? That's not the end. He can serve his time, be rehabilitated, and be set free. Can this same thing happen in the heavenly realm? Wouldn't it be wonderful if it's possible? Christians hold this view, believe that it can and will happen to everyone who died without Christ. So, all three views agree that hell is a real place. They just disagree as to what happens to the sinner after he or she is sent there. Okay, now the moment you've all been waiting for, what I personally believe about hell. But first, a disclaimer, or maybe proclamation is a better word. Here it is. I have been a spirit-filled, Bible-believing Christian 
for over 47 years. In every sense of the word, biblically, I am a Christian. So I want you to know that my belief about hell doesn't come from a backslidden Christian, if there is such a thing, or someone who's joined a cult. I believe the Bible is the inspired word of the living God. I believe God exists as Father, Son, Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit. I believe in the redemptive work of Jesus. I believe He came to the earth as a man, lived a sinless life, suffered and died on a Roman cross, was buried, was raised on the third day, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father above all rule and authority. I am a Christian, and that's a fact. Every essential Christian doctrine that makes one a Christian, I agree with. But I do not believe that hell is a place that God is going to send people to be tormented for all of eternity. In my estimation, eternal conscious torment is a view that neither lines up with the Bible nor does it align with the character of God. What I do believe is a bit of a mixture of the other two views. I believe that the unsaved will be judged and cast into the lake of fire. As I said a minute ago, all three views agree on this point. But after that is where I branch off to my own interpretation. And by the way, regarding the topic of hell, I feel it's okay to do that. Some would lead you to believe that the eternal conscious torment view is an essential Christian doctrine, and to stray from that belief is heresy. They are wrong. Period. Hell is a topic that is open to debate. Okay, back to what I believe. So the unsaved are in hell. Now what? Well, in Matthew 13, verses 42 and 50, Jesus describes the scene in a place which he describes as the furnace of fire. It's safe to say he's talking about hell. In that place, he says, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I wonder if by saying that, Jesus is describing two distinctly different types of people. After all, weeping and gnashing of teeth are clearly two totally different responses to what's just happened to them. Let's talk about the first group. Why are they weeping? Remorse? The realization that God really is good and they just blew it? Possibly, while they were standing before the throne of God, their eyes were open to the love and power of God, something they were never aware of when they lived on the earth. But as they're in hell suffering, I believe that those people will come to a place of complete humility, complete repentance, and they will desire God and want to be with Him forever. And I believe that those people can and will be saved. After all, would God leave a soft-hearted soul like that in a place of eternal torment? I think not. But on the other hand, there's that second group of people who will curse God for their fate and will never repent. Satan and the demons, which I believe the Bible teaches are fallen angels, are proof positive that some can know God intimately, rebel, and never be brought to repentance. So, I believe that there will be human beings who are cast into hell and they gnash their teeth at God because of it and they never repent. My belief is that the fate of those ungodly, unrepentant sinners will be annihilation. They will suffer utter destruction. They will cease to exist. The book of Revelation refers to this as the second death. Well, there you go. That's what I believe about hell. What changed my mind? And I say that because for the first 30 years of my being a Christian, I accepted the most widely taught view of hell, which is obviously eternal conscious torment. In fact, I hadn't even heard that much about the other two views. Like a dumb sheep, I just followed what the masses believed. So what did change my mind? Well, the first thing that changed my mind was the wonderful information in Steve Gregg's book. 
The second thing that began to mold my belief was when I began to consider biblical judgment. You see, the judicial system of God revealed in the Old Testament law has always been eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life. That is, just and fair, balanced and equal. Spending eternity in a place of horrific suffering surely isn't a just and balanced punishment for 75 years of life here on earth, especially when we're talking about someone who may have been a good person, but just never knew Jesus. I'll bet you have relatives and friends who fit that description. They're great people, but they just won't surrender their life to the Lord. Now imagine that relative at the judgment. They're condemned and thrown into the lake of fire, a place of unimaginable suffering. They're there in hell a thousand years, a million years. How about a trillion years, if you can even imagine that long? In agony the whole time, and they haven't even begun to pay their debt. For what? For a few years of life on earth? It's unthinkable. Because I know my Heavenly Father and I know His Word, I just can't justify that in this little walnut of mine. It's just plain unthinkable. Hey, it might turn out to be true. If it is, then let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. The third reason I was convinced that hell is not a place of eternal conscious torment is this thought. Jesus, when He came to the earth, He taught us to love our enemies. But what's He going to do with His enemies? Is He going to throw them into a lake of fire and torment them forever and ever? Once again, I say, unthinkable. I spoke earlier about the day of a person's death. So what are we saying here? Jesus, revealing the heart of the Father, loves sinners. He loves them. He wants them to be saved, so much so that it seems like that's all He thinks about. He seeks them out constantly. He calls to them. He knocks on the door of their hearts, all the way up to the time of their death, and then at that instant, He can't stand them, and He throws them into a lake of fire, into hell. Is that what happens? Come on, man, think about it. Okay, look, I don't have all the answers, but I trust my Heavenly Father. One of these three views is probably correct, or it could be the fourth view that I lean toward. But one of the views that I've presented to you is most likely what hell is. The only thing I'm pretty certain of is that it's not the popular traditional view that most Christians have bought into. Obviously, I think I've presented a pretty good case for what I believe, but honestly, I can't be sure. So I leave it in the hands of an all-wise, loving God. And I trust God. I trust Him in this with all of my heart. God is good. God is love. And whatever hell is, He created it, and He created it to be what He wants it to be. Hell is whatever our wise and loving God wants it to be. So why is this topic important? It's important because what you believe about hell has a strong impact on how you think about God. For example, if you believe that God's character would allow Him to cast millions of men, women, and children into hell, where they're tormented forever and ever and ever, then that reveals something you believe about God, the God you worship and serve. I'm not saying with complete certainty that you're wrong, and I'm not saying that that would make God a bad God, because if that is what hell is, then God has a very good reason for creating it for that purpose. And when I stand before Him, along with everyone else, I will know and I will say, I understand God. And it's going to be just, and it's going to be fair, and it'll be tempered with His love and His grace and His faithfulness and all His other wonderful attributes. Okay? Well, thank you for staying with me. I hope this video has been a help and a blessing to you. And I hope it's brought many of you hope. 
because those loved ones that you know died without the Lord, hey, there's still hope that they'll be saved. God bless you. I'll see you next time.